Hello and welcome to Miniature Adventures. I'm Big Lee and this week I want to talk about lead rot, myth or miniature killer. So back in 2009, shortly after I began my blog, I wrote something that struck a chord of dread amongst miniature enthusiasts, the notorious phenomenon known as lead rot. This strange sanding process seemed like a, a, a B-movie horror come to life, eating through beloved lead miniatures and leaving nothing but powdery residue behind. Now, over the years, the topic has returned time and again among collectors, prompting the question, in today's world of advanced alloys and modern foundries, is lead rot still lurking in toy boxes? So this week I wanted to ask, was it ever real? Or just a miniature collector's tall story become myth over time? And if it is real, is it still an issue or has it become a thing of the past? Now, over the 40 years that I've been, I've spent collecting and painting miniatures, I've heard many harrowing stories. <laughs> a, a painter wants models with solid, pristine surfaces, not ones that crumble mid-stroke. That drives the central question, is le lead rot a legitimate issue or merely a myth? Well, to answer that, it helps to know what lead rot looks like. That collectors often describe a powdery discoloration that can appear greenish, brownish, greyish, but most commonly a sort of whitish grey bloom on the surface of models. In more extreme cases, the surface becomes pitted and rough. Photos of severely affected figures are enough to make any collector's toes curl, but before jumping to conclusions about disease or fungus, we need to consider the chemistry. So a more likely explanation comes from conservators working with delicate museum models. Uh, on the Naval Sea Systems Command website, uh, the curator of Navy ship models refers to his this corrosion phenomenon as lead disease or lead cancer or lead bloom. They explain that sometimes a piece can be completely consumed, leaving only a white or grey residue behind, an unmistakable sign of chemical corrosion rather than a biological affliction. Incidentally, I'm going to put links to all of the sites I refer to in the description below. So if you want to go and check out the source material for today's subject, please do. Now this residue is not rust in the familiar red sense, but rather lead carbonate, also known as uh, sericite, a, a white powdery transformation of the lead surface. The process unfolds when lead metal contacts uh, acid vapours such as acetic or formic acid in the presence of carbon dioxide. These acids react with lead to form lead acetate and lead hydroxide. And these in turn react further with carbon dioxide to form lead carbonate. Crucially, this carbonate releases more acid, making the reaction self-perpetuating and potentially catastrophic. Now the substance produced is not a mere surface film that can be brushed away, it's the lead itself transformed. Microscopic analysis shows that the surface has been converted into powder, meaning that a measurable amount of actual lead is gone, replaced by entirely by corrosion products. But what fuels this process and can the miniatures collector mitigate against the risk in their older lead miniatures? Acid sources are abundant in many hobby environments. Wood, especially composite materials and cardboard, can off-gas organic acids like acetate and formic acid. Some paints, varnishes, adhesives, including PVA glue, and even cleaning products may emit vapours over time. Museums have documented how volatile organic compounds from the curing of paints and varnishes can degrade lead artefacts. For example, in polychrome lead sculptures, kept with display in, within display cases. In another article that the Canada Conservation Institute highlighted uh, preventative conservation strategies for metal objects that are deeply relevant here. They stress that maintaining low humidity, avoiding pollutants, filtering air and ensuring proper ventilation are critical to preventing corrosion. They underscore that even the thin metal coatings or metallic paints are fragile and can be compromised by pollutants or fluctuations in the environment. One dramatic example comes from a real world museum scenario in a conservation uh, discussion, a curator preparing a large collection of toy soldier miniatures observed that about 12 out of 64 had developed signs of lead corrosion. These manifested as grey or brown crusts and white powdery eruptions beneath the paint. Chemical testing confirmed it was lead carbonate. The cause appeared to be poor storage conditions including contact with cardboard and plywood which likely facilitated acid exposure over time.
Collectively, these examples illustrate that lead rot is a genuine phenomenon. It's not a myth. Chemical in nature and entirely consistent with the principles of metal conservation. It's not myth, but rather an environmental hazard born from organic uh, acid exposure and confined stagnant surroundings. How relevant is this threat today? Well, many modern miniatures use white metal or pewter alloys, mixtures of tin and timony, and occasionally small amounts of lead, zinc, or bismuth. These are significantly more resistant to acid induced corrosion than older castings made from nearly pure lead. That suggests newer pieces are far less vulnerable than older models. Nevertheless, if you've accumulated unpainted older figures, some might still be at risk. When it comes to prevention, conservation wisdom dovetails rather neatly with model painting advice. Proper priming and sealing of models, especially undercoating every surface, including undersides of the models, creates a barrier that limits exposure to carbon dioxide and acids, effectively interrupting the corrosion cycle. It's also prudent to reconsider display and storage environments. Plastic or glass shelving offers a safer option than wooden display cases, which can produce acid-laden microclimates, even without physical contact with the metal surface. Wood acidity can be particularly strong in hardwoods, though even softwoods aren't entirely uh, benign, especially if they are sealed or varnished. Ideally, models should be stored in well-ventilated spaces to avoid trapping damaging vapour. Humidity also plays a significant role. Studies show that higher relative humidity can enhance the corrosivity of acid vapours towards lead. Conversely, maintaining moderate and stable atmospheric conditions reduces the risk of corrosion in your collection. If a model shows early signs of corrosion, restorative efforts may help, although they may be, it must be handled with care. Physically removing the oxidised powdery layers may rescue the figure as long as the environmental conditions are corrected and the surface properly sealed afterwards. However, such damage is irreversible in terms of restoring original material. You know, parts dissolved into carbonate powder can't be recovered, only reshaped or resurfaced. Now, across the conservation literature, various techniques are documented for treating lead corrosion. In archaeological context, uh, electrolytic reduction and chemical cleaning have been employed, especially for heavily mineralised objects. Lead carbonate is usually the dominant corrosion product observed on archaeological lead, with occasional oxides and sulphides also reported. Yet, yeah, of course, these techniques are complex and beyond the scope of hobbyists' toolkit. They take uh, home, uh, the, the take home message is that once corrosion has started, early action is vital. Removing powder, applying protective coatings, and mitigating environmental conditions can stop progression, but full restoration is often impractical. So, let's put all of this information together. Lead rot isn't a myth. It's real and it can ravage lead miniatures if conditions allow. The risk has declined with modern pewter alloys, but older figures remain vulnerable. Prevention is straightforward and effective. Apply a full primer coatings to avoid um, acid emitting and avoid acid emitting materials. Ensure proper ventilation and control humidity. If you catch early stages of corrosion, you can clean and seal to preserve your models, and then you can enjoy them for years to come. So in closing, recognising the chemistry behind lead rot, it's environmental, predictable and preventable. By using conservation principles alongside painting best practices, you can shield your miniatures from chemical fate and keep your collection intact. So as usual, I'd like to end by asking, is this a phenomenon that you've encountered in your own collections? Or did you, until now, consider it an old grognard's tall towel? As always, I'd love to hear what you think in the comments below. So we've got time for a channel update. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, after a lot of thought, I finally switched on channel memberships. Since then, I've been putting together some members-only videos alongside my regular uh, content. I think of them as a little thank you to those who've chosen to support the channel in that way. And of course, a bit of encouragement for others who might want to join in too. But don't worry, I haven't forgotten about everyone else. It's all about you, subscribers, viewers, commenters, that you've built this channel into what it is today, and I'm genuinely grateful for every single one of you. Now, over the next few weeks, you'll see me um, experimenting 
uh, with some shorter video formats. The idea is to try out a few new things, see what connects with the current audience and hopefully reach some new viewers as well. Um, nothing set in stone, this is more of a trial run and I'll be keeping a close eye on the data to figure out what works and what doesn't. As always, I would love to hear what you think, so drop your thoughts in the comments. And, and if you can, hit like, or even dislike, <laughs> uh, share the video, and maybe even consider memberships if you'd like to support, can uh, help support the channel going forwards. Now one last quick note, I, I'm heading off on a family holiday in uh, just over a week. Don't worry, videos are already scheduled and lined up uh, ready, so that uh, the only thing that might change is how quickly I can reply to comments depending on the internet where I'm staying. Uh, but rest assured, I'll be trying to uh, keep reading everything and jumping into the conversation whenever I can. So I think we have time for a book review this week. I've not done one for a while. Um, now, I've just finished rereading Band of Brigands by Christy Campbell. And if you're into the story of tank development or the history of the First World War, it's definitely worth your time. The book covers the birth of the tank right up to 1918. At nearly 500 pages, it can feel a little bit heavy, um, but it is absolutely packed with detail, balancing political rivalries and Whitehall intrigue with the experiences of ordinary soldiers. That mix means the story moves smoothly between London clubs and the mud of the Somme. Now Campbell starts with the, the Western Front locked in stalemate. The Germans dug in, determined to hold their early gains, while the Allies keep trying to break through with the same old methods, men, shells and bayonets. It's the familiar image of fertility, where no one could see an end to the slaughter. In the background though, inventors and officers were searching for a new weapon to restore movement. Poison gas only made things worse, but a handful of visionaries dreamed of a machine that could cross no man's land and crush enemy trenches. The book then traces how those dreams became reality. From bizarre landship ideas and dodgy prototypes came the first true tank, Little Willy, followed by a centipede and finally the Mark I. Secrecy was almost a joke. Questions were even asked in Parliament about landships and printed in Hansard. Fortunately, the Germans seemed not to notice. Training for the new machine, uh, machine gun heavy section began at Elvenden Hall in Norfolk, but few of the recruits had any real idea what the front was like. The machines, of course, were far from ready. They broke down constantly and were horrific to crew, sweltering, deafening, filled with choking fumes. Yet they were thrown into action on the Somme, where their bloody debut was, well, let's no put no point, finer point about it, they were a disaster. But from there, the story is one of slow improvement mixed with repeated failure. Commanders often fought battles with the same flawed plans, hoping that minor tweaks would bring success. That being said, the tanks impressed enough to be built in greater numbers. And at Cambrai, they were used in a true combined arms attack. And at first, the breakthrough was spectacular. But the lack of reserves meant the Germans counter-attacked, retaking most of the ground, and even capturing several tanks to study for themselves. Reading these accounts, I often wanted to shout at the page. The suffering pours out of these first-hand reports, and the waste of life is truly staggering. But Campbell also makes it clear that generals like Haig weren't quite the dinosaurs they were often painted as. They were open to new ideas, but the way innovations were used, piecemeal, premature, poorly supported, meant disaster usually followed. Despite the grim story, Band of Brigands is a fascinating read. It captures the frustration, the waste and the flashes of ingenuity that eventually gave birth to modern armoured warfare. It's earned a spot on my shelves and I'd happily recommend it to anyone with an interest in the period. So that's it for this week. As always, please join the conversation in the comments below and if you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe and share. And maybe you consider becoming a member. And of course, if you want to keep up to date with weekly content from this channel, please tap the bell notification icon. So until next week, stay safe, keep gaming, and of course, keep rolling high.